Custom look and feel is the topic for today. This is a feature of high scripting that we can use to change the design of the stock controls without having to use image files. The way we do this is very similar in many respects to using paint routines to customize panels. If you're not familiar with paint routines, I recommend you pause this video and go and watch the paint routine tutorials. I'll leave links in the video description. First of all, I'd like to show you a project I'm working on. This project that you can see now contains no images at all. Everything you see is done with a combination of paint routines and panels and custom look and feel functions. So we've got knobs, we've got sliders, and we've got buttons, and combo boxes, although these don't have any options so there's nothing to uh, drop down from yet. And uh, these are buttons as well. If I click this one we can see the preset browser. This is Heise's standard preset browser. I've customized the buttons with look and feel, and these buttons I've turned into icons using look and feel. There are also some paint routines going on here as well with some panels. In the settings page, again, I'm using custom look and feel to style default highs control. So this is the channel list floating tile. We've got the custom settings floating tile here and here you can see the customized combo boxes. And the engine tab again comes from the custom settings floating tile, which I've applied the custom look and feel functions to. If I temporarily hide the custom look and feel, I'll go to view, reset custom look and feel. You can see the standard highs components that I've used to build the interface. So you can see the standard knobs there and sliders and buttons, combo boxes, and the preset browser. You'll notice things like these arcs behind the knobs remain even though I've reset the custom look and feel. That's because these are done with paint routines and are part of the panels behind, they're not actually part of the knobs. Now I'm going to make a brand new project and I'll show you how to use custom look and feel. Here's an empty project, I've added a main interface script to it, but apart from that it's completely empty. To use the look and feel functions, we need access to the look and feel object. We create this ourselves by declaring a constant, and we'll call it laugh, L-A-F, for look and feel. And we call an engine function, engine dot create global script look and feel, and we assign it to our constant. And this object is now our gateway into the world of custom look and feel. So I'll hit F5 and that's all the setup done. We'll start with a really simple example. I'll add a button to the UI. And we'll change the ID to btn thing zero. In order to style this button with look and feel, we need to write a paint routine and give it to our laugh object. This is very similar to how you assign a paint routine to a panel. There is one important difference though. When we assign a paint routine to a panel, it affects only that one panel. Look and feel functions on the other hand, will affect all controls of the same type. This has some interesting side effects which we'll look at later on. To create our new look and feel paint routine, we have to use one of the functions in our look and feel object. The function is called register function. So write laf.register function. You can think of this as doing the same job as the set paint routine function we use for panels. This function requires two parameters. The first parameter defines which type of control we want to customize. In this case, it's a button, so we pass in the string draw toggle button. There's a list of available options for this in the highs documentation, and I'll leave a link in the video description so you can find that. The second parameter is our paint routine function. So just like with a panels paint routine, 
we pass in a function and we get access to the graphics object, which we call G. And we also get access to an additional object, which we'll call OBG. We'll have a look at this OBG object in more detail soon. And then we add curly braces to finish off the function there. So I just hit compile and you'll notice the button vanished. The button's still there, it's just invisible. This is exactly the same thing that happens to panels when you assign an empty paint routine to them. So we can see if I click, the button is still actually there, it's just invisible. This happens because Heise is now expecting us to define how the button should look inside this function that we've registered with our look and feel object. So for now, let's just do something really simple. We'll just paint the button as one big red rectangle. We'll just fill the entire area with red. Again, this is very similar to how we do things in paint routines. We're going to write g.fillallcolors.red and I'll hit F5, and our button is now a red rectangle. Let's add two more buttons to our UI. We'll just duplicate this one. These both show up as red rectangles too. That's because all buttons are now using our look and feel function. We didn't have to assign an individual function to each button. So what happens is Heise is looping through every single button on the interface and applying our look and feel function to it. It does this one button at a time, and every time it enters our function, it populates the OBJ object with some information about the particular button that it's drawing. We can access that information to alter the design for each button as needed. So the properties that are available in the OBJ object vary depending on the type of control. Buttons have different properties to sliders, sliders have different properties to combo boxes, etc. We can see the properties available in our object by writing console.print trace object. Console.print will use the trace function, which expands an object or an array when it's printed to the console. Write obj in there and hit F5. So now we can see the properties that we have available. Let's make this a bit larger. So it starts here. So it's Printing this, this section here is for the first button, this section is for the second button, and this section is for the third button. So we'll just focus on the third button for now. So we'll zoom in on that. So we can see the properties that we've got available. We've got the area, which is an array, and the area is the X, Y width and height of the button. Enabled is, is the button enabled or not. Text is the button's text. Currently that's the same as the button's ID, but we can change that. Over is the mouse state of the button, is the mouse over the button. Down is, is the button being pressed? Do we have the mouse held down on it? Value is the button on or off. So one for on, zero for off. And then we've got some color properties there, which are the standard color properties that you see in the interface designer. Background color, item color one, item color two, text color. And then we've got the parent type. Now, one thing to note here is that says item color one and item color two. But if we look in the property editor, we'll see that item color one is just called item color over here. It doesn't make a big difference, but it's just something you need to be aware of that this item color here is referred to as item color one in the OBJ object. Okay, let's change the text of these buttons. So this one can be button zero. This can be button one, and this can be button two. And you can see it's already outputting it to the console, the updated text in the OBJ object. Let's hit compile on that, make that smaller again. Let's change our function slightly and use the button's background color property as the fill color. So we can get rid of this line, and instead of using colors.red, we're going to use obj.bgColor. And I'll hit F5. And now all of our buttons have turned gray. Let's change the background color property of each of our buttons over here in the property editor. So I'll have the first one red. Second one will make blue. And the third one can be green. 
So as we saw, the OBJ object also gives us access to the button's value. We can use this in an if statement to tell if the button is on or off. So if the value is one, it's on, and if the value is zero, it's off. Let's use the value property now to change the color of our buttons depending on if they're on or off. So if obj.value, this is the on part, else, this is the off part. So if the button's on, we'll fill it with the background color property. So we'll just cut that and paste it here. And if it's off, we'll use its item color property. g.fillall obj.itemcolor1. And I'll hit F5. And all of these buttons are off, but if I click them, we can see they change color. And then now off again. So now we can differentiate between buttons that are on and buttons that are turned off. We can condense this if statement into a single line using the ternary operator. It will do exactly the same thing, but it will take up less room and be a bit easier to read and maintain. I'll comment out the long version and write the ternary version below. So we're saying there if the value is 1, Then we use the colon, also known as the ternary operator, as an else. And I'll hit F5. So this one line is doing exactly the same as this entire block. So we'll remove this block now. The obj object also gives us access to the button's text property. Let's add that to our look and feel function. We'll use the g.drawAlign text function to draw the text, but before we do that we need to set the colour of the text. We'll use the button's text colour property for that. g.setColor obj.textColor so now we've set the color, we can draw the text. We'll use the g.drawAlign text function for this. This function takes three parameters. The first parameter is the text we want to write. In this case, it's going to be obj.text. The second element is the area in which we want to draw the text. This is an array with four elements, representing the X position, Y position, width and height. We want our text to occupy the complete area of the button, so we'll use the obj.area property that we saw earlier. This is already an array. The last parameter is the text alignment property. We're going to have our text centered, so we'll write centered here. I'll hit F5 and you can see that each button has its text drawn across it. As you get more experienced with custom look and feel, you'll want to be able to differentiate between controls so you can draw them differently. For example, you may want one button to be round and one button to be square. Currently, all of our buttons look almost exactly the same. Now usually in our scripts we use the component ID to differentiate between controls, but we don't have access to the ID inside our look and feel functions, so we have to find other ways to do it. One way is to use the text property, but you can use any of the properties as long as it allows you to tell the controls apart in a way that works for you. Let's have a look at that now. We'll change the text of our second button to round. R-O-U-N-D. Now in our look and feel function, we'll check the text property of the button, and if the text is round, we'll fill a rounded rectangle instead of filling the button's whole area. If obj.text is round, g.fill rounded rectangle, and we'll use obj.area, so we get the entire area of the button, and we'll give it a rounded corner size of 5. Else, so if the text isn't round, g 
dot fill rectangle and again obj dot area now one thing we need to change is currently we're doing fill all here instead of filling all here since we're now doing the fill part here we'll just change this to set color so we're setting the color to either the background color or the item color And we'll hit F5 and our second button should be a rounded rectangle. Let's zoom in on this a bit. There we go. Let's make that more pronounced. We'll change the corner size to 10. So there, the second button is now rounded and the other buttons are rectangles. And this is based on the button's text property. Now we'll change the width and height of button three. Let's make it a perfect square. We'll make it 50 by 50. In our look and feel function, we'll check element two and three of the button's area object. These correspond to the width and height. And if the two values are equal, it means that the button must be a square and will fill an ellipse. So we'll end up with a circular button. So let's just add an else if here. obj dot area two equals obj dot area three so if the width and height are the same it must be a square and then we'll do g dot fill ellipse obj dot area and when i hit f5 button three should become a circle so those are a couple of ways you can differentiate between buttons to customize them individually Later this month I'll post an extra video to Patreon that shows a more sophisticated way of differentiating controls using their text properties, so keep a lookout for that. I said earlier that Highs will use our look and feel function to redraw all buttons on the interface. Well that doesn't just include the buttons on our interface script, but all of the toggle buttons throughout the Highs interface. Let's go to the main workspace and we'll add an LFO You can see that the buttons here have taken on our custom look and feel function. This is not usually what they'd look like. Usually they'd look like this. And if I just hit F5 again, they now look like this, which is the same style we've got for our custom look and feel. To prove that further, you can see that the text is white here. If we change it, so instead of having that, if we just write g.setColor, colors.red so all of the buttons will have red text we can see that updates here as well in the case of buttons this isn't such a big deal but when it comes to sliders and knobs this can cause some real problems let's jump back over to my other project briefly so i can show you what happens when you're using look and feel to style knobs and sliders so we'll go to the main workspace and we'll add an effect let's add a simple gain you can see it completely messes up the interface of the highs modules and makes them unusable. The first time I encountered this, I thought it was a bug and that look and feel would be something I'd avoid. But let's go back to our, our project and I'll show you how we work around this. So first of all, let me explain why this happens. Highs is built with a C++ framework called Juice. Amongst other things, Juice provides a way for C++ developers to style the GUI of their programs. And the method they use to do this is called look and feel. And since Highs is built with Juice, it uses these look and feel functions to create its GUI. So everything we see here is using the Juice look and feel functions. When we access the custom look and feel through our scripts, what we are actually doing is accessing the look and feel functions of Juice that the Highs interface is also using. So any changes we make to our UI will always be applied to the highs UI as well. So to get the most out of look and feel, you have to work with it, quirks and all, and not against it. And let me show you what I do. So the first thing I do is I wrap all of my look and feel code into a namespace. Namespace, look and feel.
This just isolates the code into its own nice little area. It doesn't change any of the functionality. If I hit F5, everything's still exactly the same and it's still the same here. Then what I do is I put this code into an external JavaScript file. So I highlight it all, right click, go to move selection to external file. And I write here, look and feel, hit OK. And it includes it as an external file automatically in on init for us. If I go into our project folder and I go to scripts, you can see it's created this JavaScript file here. And there's our look and feel namespace inside there. So now if we want to work on the look and feel of our project, we have to go to this drop down menu and select the file look and feel.js and then we can work on it just like we would with any other script. Let's uh, go back to using the text color of the button here. There we go. Now when I'm working in the main interface, I obviously don't want to see all of the controls using my look and feel. I don't have this sort of situation, which is unusable. So what I do is I go to my script, go to the on init part of my script, and I just comment out this line and hit F5. So that disables the look and feel that I've written. You'll see it's no longer visible in this drop down. Then I go to view and reset custom look and feel. And you'll see the buttons now take on their default appearance. And if I go to the front main workspace, these buttons also take on their own default appearance. One thing I'd advise is when you're resetting the look and feel is save your project beforehand because Highs is prone to crashing when making this transition, especially with larger projects. So now when I want to go back to editing my GUI and I want to see the look and feel again, I just uncomment this line and hit F5. There we go. Again, I'd save usually before doing that. And then again, if I want to go back to the default controls, comment that out, hit F5, reset the look and feel. And sometimes you'll see this, it goes into this uh, sort of weird uh, mode here where it shows these blue dials and these checkboxes. If you add another module, they'll actually reset. I don't know why that happens. Just one of those quirks you've got to work with. So this has been an introduction to the High's custom look and feel. In next month's video, we'll take a look at making some custom sliders and knobs using these look and feel techniques. I hope this has been useful to you. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Also check the video description for links to the relevant documentation. If you enjoyed this video, please consider joining my Patreon community. Again, the links in the video description. Click like and share the video with anyone you think would be interested in seeing it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.